Somebody else? Hi, Emma. So I was just saying, uh, what I'm going to do in these talks, I'm going to start from the assumption that you guys know what a tensor is, but you've never encountered a tensor network algorithm before. And take you from there up to the point where um, you can hopefully uh, read about any tensor network algorithm, understand what's involved in it, um, hopefully, have, hopefully be able to work out what its strengths and weaknesses are, and feel comfortable about sitting down and trying to implement it. Now, um, I know Anne's doing the Advanced Quantum Information course. Is anyone, do, is anyone else doing the... No, nobody else here from... No. no. You've got the option if you want to, I believe. I'm just checking this with Michaela. Um, uh, but you've got the option of treating this as a module in that course if you want to. Yes. Yeah. 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 I thought there was also another There is, but the emphasis is going to be different. Uh, my emphasis is going to be on getting your understanding tensor network algorithms so you can go away and use them, whereas uh, Jacob Biamont is going to be talking about them from a more mathematical viewpoint, I believe. Um, we'll have to wait and see. I know he's done, some, he's, done, he's done a lot of work on the mathematical structures underlying them. So, uh, yeah, the aim is that we're going to try not to overlap too much, so there will be a bit. Um, if, if Michaela Moskva gives me the go-ahead to treat this as a module, the assessment will be to implement, um, to implement the TEBD algorithm um, to calculate the ground state of an n side Is that volume block estimation? Yeah. Uh, it to calculate, to do evolution in imaginary time and calculate the ground state of an n site Ising chain. Um, I'm going to give lots of information about that as we go. So it should be hopefully fairly straightforward. And if you choose to do it in MATLAB, I'll, I'll even be providing a helpful little function for contracting two tensors to get you started. C++ is also nice, but whatever you like. If you do it, your call. You can probably see how, we, see how the lectures shape up and then decide after that. Anyway, starting at the beginning, guys. Um, what is a tensor network? So I'm going to start from something really quite obvious and familiar, which is um, a way of writing a state on an n site lattice in terms of a set of coefficients in a particular basis. Um, <coughs> so, for example, uh, I1, I2, if we're dealing with, say, um, if we're dealing, say, with a lattice with local dimension 2, so a lattice of spins that can be spin up or spin down, for example, then I1, I2, and so on would correspond to spin up or spin down at the different lattice sites. So you'd be dealing with a sum over states such as, for example, of etc over as many sites as there are in, in the basis you're working in. So that's pretty straightforward. And already we have a tensor appearing on the scene because C is an object consisting of a, consisting of a set of numbers uh, with n indices. And the values these indices take tell you which parameter within C you're looking at. So C is actually an n index tensor. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to decompose this tensor. We're going to write it as, um, as a sum over a series of other tensors, which if we were to evaluate that sum, would give us back the original tensor C. So what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're going to write it like this. And I'm just going to assume that we're summing, well, this sum is over all lattice site indices and also over um, all repeated indices. And so what we could do is we could actually evaluate this sum. We could sum over these indices, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, so on. 
uh, the repeated indices that I've introduced. And, these indices, and, we, uh, and providing we'd chosen these tensors correctly, <coughs> we could recover the, original, uh, recover the original tensor C. Now, this is already um, a tensor network ANSATS. In fact, it's a very popular one known as the matrix product state. This is the ANSATS that underlies um, popular algorithms such as DMRG, uh, which is widely used in physics and in chemistry and um, also underlies the TEBD algorithm, which I'll be talking about more, in more detail later. So the superscripts are one and two. One, two. These are just to distinguish that these, and one, two there again on the lambdas, just to distinguish that these are not the same tensor. I mean, here it's obvious because this is a two-index tensor, this is a three-index tensor, and so on. But the point I'm making is that uh, I've, chosen to lay, I've chosen to call all the tensors with a physical index gamma, the ones without them lambda. You might wonder why these lambdas are actually here, given that we could absorb them into a gamma, but I'll explain that later. It's convenient to keep them there. Um, so yes, what we have is a series of tensors, all of which are potentially different, uh, but when we evaluate the sum over the repeated indices, we recover our original description of the quantum state. Now, so far, this might seem like a fairly pointless exercise. We've gone from a description of a state in terms of um, where d is the local dimension, d to the n parameters, to a description of a state in at least d to the n parameters, uh, possibly more. Uh, that's because at this stage, what I haven't done yet is introduced any approximation. Ultimately, in any tensor network algorithm, um, the, the main, the, the, what you're after is a way to um, efficiently represent just part of the Hilbert space. And you want that to be the part of the Hilbert space that you're interested in studying. For example, the low energy um, regime of a particular Hamiltonian is, uh, is the most common example. And so what you need to do is you need to choose your tensor network as ANSATs like this. You choose some structure, some decomposition of the original tensor, which is going to suit the low energy regime of the Hamiltonian you're studying, for example. And I'll explain, a bit, I'll explain that more later. But for now, let's just say that some, Hamilton, some decompositions are better suited to particular Hamiltonians than others. Um, and can then... You, can you give us an example? Like, if you did the spin one chain... And then wrote the KLT states, and then you can explicitly write the matrices, right? And show how they contract. So I'm not familiar with the, um, with the AKLT state enough to do that for you. Okay, maybe we can in incorporate it in one of the later talks. Because I think there is a matrix product state, right? And then the, mm -hmm. matrix, the matrix elements of specific like, physical meaning, right? Like the, you can write it so the diagonals are the, you know, the SC states. And, and, right, and right. then when you do all the, the index contraction, you can see basically 1B how. Mm. It's, just an, it's just to make it concrete. Maybe. Okay, okay. Well, I'll see what I can dig up. Maybe. That'd be nice. Yeah, thanks, Roger. So, yes, um, what we're going to do in this particular example is we're going to take these repeated indices alpha, beta, gamma, and so on, um, which in general, if we were to be able to reproduce any C, um, alpha would have to be an index running from 1 to D, so we call it an index of dimension D. Uh, beta would have to run from 1 to d squared, gamma from 1 to d cubed. What we do is we put an upper bound on this. We say, okay, we're going to approximate, we're going to truncate these indices and say that they range from 1 to at most some parameter. Um, for the MPS, it's commonly denoted big D. We're going to put that, put that as an upper limit on what these indices can range from, from and to. Now, We'll Wait, still be why, is it, why is there only two indices on I1? Is that because it's open boundary? Uh, yes, this will become. Well, I'm working with an open chain here. And so then, all, then they all. Then then the last one N also has just two indices. That's right. And everything else is three. Yeah. Um, well, the lambdas will have two. This is going to become clearer in a moment because I'm going to introduce a diagrammatic notation, which makes life much much easier. But I thought I'd best start from somewhere concrete, so somewhere that people will be familiar with. So. Uh, we limit the range of these indices, alpha, beta, gamma, the repeated indices. And what that does, it means that we can still reproduce, for, for some specific states, we can still reproduce them exactly. For others, we can only at best approximate them. Um, so long as those approximations happen in regimes that are of no interest to, well, so long as those approximations are good in the regime that's of interest, we don't care if the, if say, for example, very high temperature states that are going to play a very small role in our 
um, in our simulation of a low energy regime. We don't care if they're represented rather badly. Uh, we're, only, uh, we're only interested in representing one particular subregion of the Hilbert space, and we're going to. And how useful that is depends on the problem you're studying. Depends on, for example, if you're studying dynamics within the low temperature regime, or if you're just computing the ground state. Um, I was, I'll be talking more about the limits of particular tensor networks later. But now I'm going to introduce the graphical notation that I've been mentioning, because this makes life much, much simpler. And it also makes it possible with more complicated tensor networks to quickly get an intuitive, intuitive grasp of what's going on. So what we're going to do is, where we have a tensor, we're going to represent that with a blob. So this is C. And for every index, we're going to put a leg on there. So these legs here correspond to index indices I1, I2, I3, all the way up to IN. Um, in general, I won't put labels on the individual indices unless I'm trying to draw attention to a particular one. Or I may even just label them with their dimension. But a blob is a tensor. A leg is an index. When we have a leg that's attached to two blobs, then that means that it's, uh, that means it's a repeated index and therefore summed over. So, for example... Um, here we have a vector because it's got just a single index. And so if we, if we look at something like this, and I'll give these names, I'll, give, I'll call them A and B, then we have an inner product between two vectors. Actually, what I'll do, I'll, although, very, although you don't often see this, it's possible to... One thing you can do is you can give a vertical orientation to every single line in your diagram. And then um, lines going down, you can say that those are lower indices. Lines going up, you can call those upper indices. And then you have a consistent way of introducing indices that lets you reconstruct, um, so it lets you reconstruct the more, more traditional expression from the diagram. Uh, this isn't vital. And typically, particularly with the NPS, you'll often see diagrams with horizontal indices in. Uh, but, um, and, you, and that's basically because it, it doesn't matter too much. The metric that we're dealing with for the vast majority of tensor network algorithms, we're dealing with a situation where the metric is Euclidean, and uh, there's no additional complications associated with raising and lowering indices. Um, there's some situations where it becomes a little more important, but that's not uh, unless you start dealing with trying to incorporate non-abelian symmetries into your algorithm. That's not something we're going to worry about in this course. So that's an inner product. Um, can I get anyone to yell out from the audience what they think this might be? Sorry? Yep, or in simpler, or more simply, multiplying two matrices. So that's and then we can also have, for example, an outer product. So that's C alpha beta equals A alpha B beta. And one more. Um, yep, that's the trace. So that's the graphical notation. And to put it in that notation, we uh, this the MPS, the tensor network handouts I've introduced you to so far. That looks like like this. Oops. Now, it's all very well for me to tell you that we can write our state like this. Uh, but I should probably 
um, explain to you how we're going to write our state like this. It could be that I've actually given you a state, explicitly written down C, and now I'm asking, and now we want to put it into this form. Um, how do we come up with this particular structure? The way we do this is by means of repeated singular value decompositions or Schmidt decompositions of, of the original tensor C. So what we can do is we can take C and we can, first of all, we, we can say we're going to decompose, we're going to divide its indices into one index describing site one and one index describing, well, we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to factorize the Hilbert space, if you like, into a tensor product. Uh, so we've got like, so we're writing it as I1 tensored I2 to IN, like so. And what we're going to do is we're going to perform a Schmidt decomposition of index of tensor C across this index and these indices. Now, a Schmidt decomposition, for those of you who aren't, aware, who aren't, who aren't familiar with it, um, it's what you do is you take a, you take a state, psi, um, and you perform a yeah, you perform a singular value decomposition on the matrix C. What this is, is it's a unique way of writing... Um, so, it's a unique... What you do, it's a way of... A singular value decomposition... Hi, Sarah. It's a way of um, taking a matrix and decomposing it in a unique manner into a unitary matrix, which we'll call... So, we're taking a matrix M, and you're writing it as a unitary matrix U, multiplied by a strictly positive, uh, no, sorry, not strict, it's uh, by a diagonal matrix S whose entries are either positive or zero and um, customarily are sorted uh, in order of descending magnitude and another unitary matrix V, well, V dagger. Uh, you can do this for any matrix and this decomposition is unique. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our tensor C, which has N indices, um, we're going to treat index 1 as, just an index, as the first index of this matrix, and then we're going to enumerate indices 2 to n um, by means of another index. So, for example, if it had three legs overall, then on sites 2 and, uh, on sites two and 3, we'd have four possible states, assuming physical dimension 2, sticking with our example of physical dimension 2, and so we'd have, um, so we've got these, we've got this set of states on, on, on those indices and on the, and on index one we've got a choice of up or down. So we have, so our matrix that we're going to be decomposing, our matrix M, is a two by four matrix. The first index, which runs from one to two, enumerates the state on leg one. The second index, which runs from 1 to 4, enumerates the states on legs 2 and 3, for example, if, if we're dealing with... Which one of those? Uh, S is a rectangular one, right? Um, yes. S, well, you have, a, you have some freedom in the way that you write this. Uh, S, you can choose to make S rectangular and U and V um, both truly... Yes, U and V are unitary matrices, square matrices, um, and S is, S is rectangular, and so will typically have non-zero entries like that, for example, or it might be like so, might be wider, wider than it's long. However, given that then um, in one of your unitary matrices, if this is rectangular, one of your unitary matrices is going to have a lot of columns which are just multiplied by zero. So in practice, um, your, the software that you implement it in will often give you the option of computing a singular value decomposition. Well, MATLAB calls it economy mode where it never actually bothers to compute um, some of the entries in your uh, unitary change of basis because they're just going to get multiplied by zero in S. Uh, that's, but yes, in, gen in, principle, um, in principle, S is the rectangular matrix there. And so what you do is 
So for example, u will be 2 by 2, s will be 2 by 4, v will be 4 by 4. Um, and so what we do then is we, get, we, call, we take u and we call that gamma 1. We take lambda 1, well, s, become, s is lambda 1, although we'll truncate off that area full of zeros, so two rows, four columns. We'll just truncate s off there and have it as a 2 by 2 matrix. And similarly, we'll truncate v, so it's only 2 by 4, to match up with the entries that, um, keeping, keeping only the two elements that match up with these two entries here. So, and then we'll expand that. Um, so that, what, we do, what we're going to get here is we're not quite up to there yet. We're up to, we have gamma 1, which is, which is u, and is 2 by 2. We have lambda 1, which is s which is 2 by 2, and we've got v, which is um, 2 by 4. But we know that this index, we can th that this, is, that this um, rank 4 index here actually corresponds to indices i2 and i3. This is i1 over here. But, so we can, we can put that back to being 2 by 2. And now what we do is we just repeat the, we just repeat the process. We ignore this portion of the diagram. We just take v dagger. And we're going to decompose it. I'm sorry, you, you probably meant to say that uh, uh, it's uh, v is 4 by 4, so. Truncating it, though, however, because we have s, which is going to look something like um, a0, 0, 0. I was just going to ask uh, whether uh, lambda is s or not. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. Uh, lambda is. Which is 2 by 4. So lambda is the portion of S which contains the diagonal elements. And so similarly, V was a um, 4 by 4 unitary matrix. But, if we're going to, but because we're going to truncate uh, S here, we truncate V here. And that gives, us, um, that gives us our 2 by 4, well, V dagger, sorry, V dagger conventionally. Uh, that gives us our V dagger here, which is 2 by 4, and which we then rewrite as 2 by 2 by 2. Now what we're going to do is we're going to basically do the same thing again, only this time we're going to take V dagger, and we've got a basis on I2, basis on I3. We've also got a two-dimensional basis on, on here. It doesn't have a physical interpretation, but we can pretend that this is... Uh, well, we can treat this as if it were a site of dimension 2. Um, and then what we're going to do this time is we're going to combine these two together into a common index, and we're going to split V dagger here. So we're going to perform a singular value decomposition on V dagger here, and that'll let us go to where we have lambda t as a gamma 2. Now, in general, for an end site, for, like, for a long chain, the dimension is going to keep going up as we continue along. Um, 2, 4, 8, 16, until you reach some, limit, some level that you cap it at. Uh, that's, the, that's big D that I introduced earlier. Similarly, starting at the other end, we can sort of go, okay, it's going to need to be 2 here, 4, 8, etc. as we work back along. And so that tells you. Um, and so now we have our tensors. Uh, so yes. Forget truncation for the time being. We, without truncating, we can just do repeated singular value decompositions and write our original state C in terms of a large number of individual tensors, gamma and lambda, where the gammas are obtained from the unitaries that we get in our singular value decomposition, and the lambdas are obtained from the... Um, and the lambdas are diagonal and strictly positive. No, strict... Well, positive. If we had a lambda that looked like this, well, we could truncate like so and truncate u and v. So, in fact, the lambda is strictly positive. If you want to... Um, yeah. So, now comes the approximation. Now comes the approximation. Because with our singular value decomposition, we can choose to have that the diagonal elements are... Like, we can, what we can do, we can choose that our diagonal elements are sorted in decreasing magnitude down the diagonal. And suppose that we decided to limit our bond dimension to, 
of our internal bond dimension big, uh, which to the value big D equals of five, or four, let's say four, then what we do is we go, we take this decreasing, these, these, these uh, we take these diagonal values in, la in lambda, um, and we truncate. We say, okay, I've got these, I've got these values here. I'm not going to, I'm only going to retain four of them. I'm not going to keep uh, the last two. Um, and this may, even, in, in general, you can tell how good this approximation is by how large these figures are. Because if E and F are both very small, say parts in 10 to the minus 10 or something, then by discarding these values, by setting them, effectively setting them to zero, you're going to have very little effect on your original tensor C when you uh, contract over all the intermediate indices. So you're going to still reconstruct the original state pretty well. If E and F are large, if they were, say, on order of 0.1 or something, then you'd certainly know that you were in trouble, uh, that you weren't going to be able to represent that state well using an MPS um, with that particular choice, uh, say, big D equals 4. You could either go to bigger D, or you could, so larger value of big D, or you could try a different tensor network algorithm, or you could try a completely different technique entirely, but you would be ill-advised in that situation to continue with an MPS with big D equals 4. So there's an intrinsic method of testing whether your approximation is appropriate to the system that you're studying, and if you start doing things like time evolution, of telling when the approximation starts to break down, you just have to monitor these parameters. And that's why I keep these lambdas in the um, in the ANZATS that I'm drawing here. Now, Excuse me. Hey, Sorry, I'm still trying to understand the, the addition in terms of the efficient decomposition. So each lambda, um, like lambda 1, lambda 2, it means that what are the Schmidt coefficients if you take the, that partition in between like the first two systems and like the n minus 2 and then the first 3 and minus 3? Exactly. Different lambdas means those Schmidt coefficients. Exactly. So for a given Schmidt decomposition, for example, 1 and 2 to n, then lambda 1 is the coefficient. This is u, and this all together is v dagger. Here we have these taken together are u. This is the Schmidt coefficients. These taken together are v dagger. Um, there's a slight subtlety when, when you come to actually implement this, which I'll come on to when I actually describe how you do TEBD which will be probably next lecture, um, or I might start this lecture and continue next lecture, um, in, that the singular, in that while a singular value decomposition, a single Schmidt decomposition, or a single singular value decomposition is unique, when you start breaking up a tensor into a long chain of tensor, into a long chain, into a long chain like this, then your decomposition is not unique, and you have to be a bit careful about how you go about it. But... Um, so, yes, I'll talk about that. So I wouldn't suggest leaping in and trying to do anything with this until I, until I actually get onto that aspect of the algorithm. So that's how you decompose. Your, if you're given an original state, you can decompose it, and then you can approximate it. Um, can I have a quick, quick question? Um, you said you can, if you keep track of the one, two, four in wave, you can see how well your approximation is. Uh, yes, if you... And when it breaks down, essentially. What I'll come on to, yeah, your question, let me guess, is you're throwing them away. How do you keep track? Yes. <laughs> What's the point of approximating if you have to keep them anyway? What happens is you don't. When you're actually performing, say, time evolution on the system, what will happen is um, you'll perform a particular, you'll perform a time evolution step, which will actually result in, that'll give you another tensor that you need to decompose to. Uh, it'll take, you'll take some region, like, from, say, lambda 1 to lambda 3 and everything in between, you'll apply a two-site operator here as part of your time evolution process. That'll give you a single large tensor, which you then need to decompose back into these components. In the process, you'll, recover, you'll get a lambda 2, which has more indices than you need, uh, more values in than you need. And that's when you check to see if any of these values have, have become non-trivial. Now... If you start from the other direction, with this recipe, you get different states, is that true? That's absolute. Well, you get the same state, but a different representation, a different... No, I mean, when you truncate. 
Oh, um, you've got, if you truncate as you go along, that's, I think that's, uh, if you truncate as you go along, that's probably going to be true. Uh, if you wait till the end, I'm not completely sure, I'm not 100% sure about that. If you perform your decomposition and then you truncate, um, then you're going to get the same state regardless of which end you start at. But what's certainly true is that your gammas are going to be different. Uh, and I'll explain, that in a, I'll explain that shortly, because that's very important to actually implementing the algorithm. So even if you perform the whole decomposition, then you do all the truncations, which end you start at is going to affect the tensors that you have. Um, I will come on to that in, let's see now then, in a moment. So I guess I should, I should probably just mention the, um, what the whole point of all of this is. The reason that we're doing this, the reason that we're doing this decomposition and then truncating the indices, is that we want to reduce the cost of actually performing simulations on quantum systems. I mean, if you work with uh, your original tensor, which requires d to the n um, which coefficients, then your cost of performing operations on this is going to be exponential in the system size, which severely limits the size of systems you can study. For example, computing ground state energies uh, under a particular Hamiltonian on an n site lattice. Um, this is that's exact, uh, using exact diagonalization, uh, with even even when there's lots of symmetries in the system and so on, people struggle on more than I think the biggest I've heard of was something on the order of 40, 50, 60 sites, something like that. And that was a supercomputer job. Now, using, uh, using uh, tensor network algorithms, what you do is, by introducing this truncation, you can reduce your number of coefficients to essentially polynomial in the system size. And provided the approximation is good for your system, provided these truncations are not too large, then you can perform your entire calculation, your computation of, of well, you, let's say for, for caution's sake, a good approximation of the ground state um, in polynomial time, because adding an extra tensor, just uh, adding an extra tensor, so an extra, sorry, adding an extra size, an extra gamma and lambda, when you reach the point where you started limiting these dimensions so they're fixed all the way along, you're just introducing um, a constant extra number of coefficients. So you end up with a cost that's polynomial in the system size to actually perform your calculations. Uh, that's, the, that's the ultimate point of tensor network algorithms. Now, Excuse me. So can you bound the uh, distance between this new state and your original state? Uh, I don't think anyone's actually looked. As far as I know, I'm not aware of any work looking at this. I guess the way you do it would be something to do with um, keeping track of just how large the uh, discarded... But a possible approach might be keeping track of how large these discarded ele elements are, but as far as I know, no one's looked at whether it's possible to formally bound the distance. What we can say is that using, um, using many of the existing tensor network algorithms, any energy we compute is certainly an upper bound on the ground state energy. Uh, on, the ground state, on the ground state energy. The ground state energy is at least this low. Uh, that can be very useful in itself. Um, with the Kagame lattice, for example, um, I think it now is at the spin one Kagame uh, antiferromagnet. Uh, I believe the best results have been obtained using tensor network algorithm techniques. For a while it was the mirror, now I think MPS is ahead again. But all we have is an upper bound. Nobody's actually sure what the... Um, what the ground state looks like. There's some debate over this. This is the one that Mero found. Uh, this is the, probably the spin one half you're talking about. You're actually, you're right. It is spin one half because that's the one that, uh, that Mero found a low energy sort of crystal like state. Yeah, the Greenland's bomb crystal, yeah. Yeah, but um, I believe there's been some, some NPS work. I think it was Steve White. Uh, oh, that's DMRG. Yeah. Uh, DMRG, that's basically. DMRG is in fact. The, the, the ANSATS inside DMRG is the MPS that I'm describing, um, although the algorithm I'm not going to go into in these talks. Uh, and that there um, obtained, that, uh, the DMRG, uh, since DMRG has obtained a lower energy, uh, which is a spin liquid, so, 
Well, the question's still open. Is, it, you know, is that actually the true ground state? We're not sure. Uh, but we do. But that's the best that anyone's managed to get so far because it's a difficult. It's a, it's a difficult system to simulate. Yeah. Am I? Sorry, I have another question. So, is it uh, clear that which kind of observables are affected more by this kind of triangulation? Like, for example, two points observable, two-point two correlations, or like... I'll come is there any intuition that these kind of observables are more affected by this transition? Say, rather, what kind of system uh, we can represent well using a particular tensor network algorithm. So it depends very much on the algorithm you're using. Um, the NPS is limited in the amount of entanglement that it can describe between two, different areas, two distant areas of the lattice. So if you have a highly entangled system, then long-range correlators are going to be described poorly. The mirror, on the other hand, um, naturally describes highly entangled systems such as, for example, uh, critical systems. We've done a lot of work on one-dimensional critical systems, um, uh, though it has also been used for two-dimensional uh, scale invariant systems as well. Um, we've, uh, uh, yeah, the mirror describes the long-range correlators in those systems very well indeed, so it's a matter of choose your algorithm c carefully. Uh, so now, I guess, where shall I go on to next? I can either start describing TEBD, or I can tell you about how, um, how you recognize. I guess I'll just tell you, how you a little bit about, um, a little bit more about the, how you recognize limitations in a tensor network algorithm, or in a tensor network ANSATS. So uh, this is on this, with this NPS here, MP, NPS ANSATS, um, I've mentioned already that what you're going to do is you're going to limit the dimension of the indices that you're, that you're working with. And, and that that's going to result in some truncation error, and that's going to be, um, that's going to limit the effectiveness of your using this ANSATS to describe a particular state. Uh, if you're given a tensor network algorithm, one thing you can look at is you can say, okay, um, if I perform a Schmidt decomposition, what? Well, if I perform a Schmidt decomposition on any state, dividing that system into two parts, then the amount of non-trivial indices I have there, so the amount of non-trivial Schmidt coefficients I have there, uh, gives a gives a crude indication of the amount of entanglement between the two uh, halves of the system. You can actually formalize this and uh, relate. Um, you can, and you can relate the dimensions of the, of the bonds that you have in the system to the maximum amount of entanglement entropy that you can encode between one half of the system and the other. So what this means is that we can take our NPS, whoops, and we can look at this and we can say, right, I'm interested in knowing how much entanglement I can encode between this half of the system and this half of the system, and the way that you do that, and the way that you determine that, is you look for a way of cutting the tensor network into. Uh, for example, we could cut like this, or we could cut like like that. We could make any crazy cut we wanted, but you look for the one where, if you take the product of all the indices that your cut traverses the product of the dimensions of all the indices that your cut traverses, you look for the one that minimizes that value, and that gives you an indication of the amount of entanglement you can encode between the two halves of the system. Now, with the NPS, this is the cut that you're looking at here, just a single cut of the system into two halves. And what you see is that as you add more sites onto the system, um, the dimension of that bond remains constant. And so you see that the scaling of the maximum amount of entanglement in NPS can encode. It's, it's a constant. It's independent of the size of the system um, or size of the size of the two regions. You're saying that limits. That's what the limits the entanglement encoded in the ground state. That's right. That's right. Now, in a product state, for example, that's fine. But to go to the other extreme, a critical state, highly entangled, in one dimension, you find that the amount of entanglement scales as the logarithm of the length of the system. And this is what led to the introduction of, uh, this, is, this is one of the ideas behind the introduction of a scale invariant mirror. It's a, uh, it's a tensor network where the simplest bipartition, the number of um, 
in the, the value of the product of the indices you have to cut for the cheapest by partition scales logarithmically in the size of the system. And so that's why the scale invariant mirror, which I'll introduce to you after we finish talking about the MPS, um, is good for critical systems. It captures this entanglement scaling. Uh, I don't quite understand this because like the spin one Heisenberg model ground state has this log L entanglement entropy. And DMRG historically has no problem uh, now, dealing with these. With these DMRG systems. does have a big advantage up its sleeve in that uh, it's very cheap computationally. So you can go to extremely large values of big D. Um, and what this means is that the distances you would have to be looking over before, things, before you start to encounter trouble, before you start to encounter problems, have to be very large. Because if big D is, uh, because what, happens, what tends to happen with the DMRG algorithm and with uh, basically, in fact, as far as I know all algorithms of the MPS, is that it tends to favor accurate uh, encoding of short range short-range uh, properties of the state. Uh, but when, when big D is very large, short-range can be very large indeed. And so in practice, you encounter, for many systems, even though they're critical, you encounter no problem using DMRG and MPS and are able to uh, extract good quality information about the system. Um, so yes. Uh, I mentioned that the aim of a tensor network uh, algorithm is to get polynomial scaling in the system size. Uh, of course, polynomial covers a multitude of sins. Um, if your scaling is... Uh, where we have this parameter big D, um, your scaling could be, for example, um, L D to the... D to the something, D to the A. If A is three or four, that's, a, um, that's going to let you go to much larger values of D than if you're working with an algorithm where A is 15, for example. So simple algorithms like the MRG have a lot, algorithms based on simple ANZETSA have a lot going for them. So, and just to give you a sort of rough peek ahead, quick peek ahead, the the mirror, which has this useful structure, in fact, just to give you an idea, we're going to be, and my aim is to, I'm going to be talking about the mirror probably in lectures three and four of this series. It has a much more complicated structure, uh, built up in layers, using tensors which are unitary or uh, we call these isometric, they're, they're like a unitary but truncated. Um, this has the advantage that there is no simple cut that you can make, that, if, uh, that as you go to larger and larger systems, the cut remains the same. So you see that, that you end up having to do cuts like, like this, for example, and as we add more sites, we add more layers and we have to extend the cut upwards, and that's how you get the logarithmic scaling. Now, uh, that's just a bit of a brief glance ahead. I've got about five or, five or six minutes left, so I'm just going to give a brief pointer as to where we're going to be going next time, which is to discuss the actual TEDD algorithm. And that's, this is an algorithm where what you do is you start with the NPS ANSATS. You say, I, don't, I have a Hamiltonian, I have an ANSATS, I don't know what the ground state is, uh, I'm going to use the TBD algorithm, for example, to perform imaginary time evolution and compute, the ground, and compute an approximation to the ground state as an NPS. So, um, we have our ANSATS. We have a Hamiltonian. Um, And we need a way to apply, uh, and what we, what we need to do is we need to come up with a time evolution gate. Which we can apply to our, we're going to, we're going to start off with some random state written in the NPS ANSATS. Uh, some, so some random NPS state, and we're going to apply our imaginary time evolution operator, 
repeatedly to this uh, initial state, and that will cause it to evolve towards the ground state. Um, repeat has required until a, suitably, until a suitable approximation to the ground state is obtained or until you reach the level of accuracy that your code will support. And, yeah. So, the first thing, the fir uh, the first thing that we need to do is we want to break our big Hamiltonian up into local terms uh, that we can apply just to say small parts of this uh, well, so, no, we need, to, we need our unitary operator to be written in terms of small local gates that can be applied to just, say, two sites on this ANSATS. Because the biggest advantage... Sure, once you've written an ANSATS in uh, terms of a polynomial number of coefficients, you're, you've made a great start. Uh, what you want to do now is, if you've chosen your ANSATS wisely, you want to be able to update this ANSATS when you're performing, say... Um, imaginary time evolution, you want to be able to update it in a local fashion, say to just work on two or three or four tensors at once, rather than having to try and update the entire ANSATS at once. Um, and so this is what makes an algorithm efficient. So an ANSATS can be an efficient representation of a state if it's polynomial in the number of coefficients, if the number of coefficients is polynomial in the system size, but an algorithm will only be efficient if you can, uh, if you can apply it cheaply to that ANSATS. So, the first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to take this um, evolution, this imaginary time evolution operator, and we're going to want to write it in a form that's going to be much more useful for us to use. Um, what we want is what's called the Suzuki Trotter decomposition. How do you guarantee that the state you start with is not a problem of the wrong state? Uh, in practice, you just generate a random state and away you go. Uh, the chances of it being completely orthogonal to the ground state are essentially negligible. Oh. Um, if you want to be certain, uh, well, in general, if you don't know a priori anything about your ground state, you have no way of being certain. But you can just repeat a few times, and uh, the more times you repeat, the more astronomical the chances of you actually missing the ground state entirely. Um, add on to that that there's always a slight amount of noise in a simulation due to rounding errors in, um, in even just rounding errors in your floating point operations. Uh, and this can often be enough to introduce a small component of the ground state, which will then grow rapidly to dominate the simulation. So in practice, it's not a problem. But the Kegamay lattice was a counterexample, right? Because it didn't sort of find a metastable ground state that was this, this valence bond crystal. Now, the, pr the problem there was that we were using, um, we were using a periodic tensor network, mm -hmm. so there was essentially an assumption that, uh, there was, that there was periodicity in the system, which was present in our ANSATs uh, before we even started. It's not a, it was not an approach that was suited to find a spin-liquid state. So the boundary condition forces some periodic order. That's right. That's what happened with the mirror simulation, whereas DMRG... Um, I suspect that simply their region of study was either they studied an open system or they studied a large enough region, I'm not familiar with the paper actually, with the DMRG paper, but they studied a large enough system that they could see within that system there was no periodicity occurring and that would be an indication that uh, you've got a, uh, you've got a disorganized... Yeah, they, yeah, they studied really long cylinders. Uh-huh. And then they, they like did different size cylinders and subtracted off the edge effects from the open. Yeah, the yeah. Open mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what the Suzuki Trotter decomposition is, is it's a way of taking an arbitrary operator and writing it in terms of a number of two body gates arranged in a pattern like this and you repeat for as many layers as necessary. Uh, the more layers that you choose, the, the higher the precision you obtain. Um, in theory, you can take any operator, perform a Suzuki Trotter decomposition, and then you have a lot of local, local gates. So you can take your time evolution operator, you can Suzuki Trotter decompose it, and then you can apply these gates locally. You can apply this one to just this part of the ANSATS, this one to just this part, to this part of the ANSATS, and so on. Um, 
and that lets you apply these gates just to small regions. So you would apply this gate here, for example. And I'll explain what I mean by apply the gate next time. But what you have is you've taken your operator, you've made it local, so you can now just look at just a small part of your entire ANZATS. And we can apply this operator also in an efficient fashion. So, that's pretty much all I'm going to have time for today. Um, quick pointer of where we're going, I guess. Um, next time, I'm going to uh, explain what I mean when I say we apply an operator to an ANZATS. I'm going to show how we perform, how we actually perform an update on our matrix product state uh, using um, uh, using using our decomposed unitary operator. Uh, I'm also going to take a particular example, the critical Ising model on um, n sites, and I'm going to show how. Given that how having a Hamiltonian that's two sites to start, how it's made up of two site local terms to start with, your life is made a lot simpler in terms of the imaginary time evolution. You don't really need to worry about formally performing the Suzuki trotter decomposition. You similarly just make two site local um, evolution gates and rapidly, uh, and just sort of start, and just start applying them, which will be useful, uh, useful tip if any if you actually want to start applying this. Next, next session, we'll be concentrating on how we would actually implement the TEVD algorithm on the MPS uh, with a lot of practical information on how you might go about this in software, how you'd go about setting up your ANZATs, how you'd go about performing your, um, how you go about uh, performing your um, time evolution, and hopefully by the end of next session, you'll have enough information that if you wanted to, you could go away and write the TEBD algorithm for the criticalizing model, or for any model, but the criticalizing model I'll be telling you a lot about, and compute the ground state energy on n sites. So. so the way you are motivating, so far it, it is very bosonic. There are no... Yes, that's right. So you will come to... Later. Probably not in this little bunch of talks. Um, I suspect in these talks, next time I'm mostly going to be talking about implementing TEVD, how you'd go about it in practice, the subtleties that you encounter regarding things like normalization, regarding things like what's very useful is that if you do it right, you can treat all of this portion as a unitary whilst you're applying this gate. Then when you're applying this gate, you can treat all of this portion as unitary, all of this portion as unitary. The stuff off to either side can just be treated as a unitary, and um, this makes it very simple, actually, to calculate expectation values of things like uh, the Hamiltonian, to, com to compute energies. Uh, there's little tricks like this, which I'll be talking about, that make your life much, much easier, but are related to... This one is related to the non-uniqueness of this decomposition, that if you start from one end, you have a different set of gammas to if you start from the other end. I'll be talking about all these practical issues next time. So, so far this has been sort of essentially a bit of an, ab a bit of an abstract theoretical overview of the ideas that go into TEDD. Next time I'll talk about the practical stuff. Um, after that I'll introduce the mirror uh, and, explain, and explain how that works. Um, if there's enough time I might even tie in a little bit of representation theory at the end which lets you get faster performance and out of your mirror by incorporating global symmetries. Uh, what I won't be doing this, in this series is talking about how we simulate fermions or how we simulate, uh, how we incorporate non-abelian symmetries. Uh, possibly I may not have time for abelian symmetries, but if I do, I'll talk about that. I won't be talking about non-abelian symmetries, fermions or anions. Um, I, might be, uh, I, might give some, I might give a bit of a talk about that at some later time but there's not going to be time in these four lectures. Any other questions on this material, on what's going to be covered next time, anything? Anything you particularly like to see? No? Ajit was tell telling about AKLT, wave function. Yeah. So I can write down, I was just trying to recollect. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe helpful for the students. 
Yeah, I think it's like a good example, right? Because you can write down the matrices, and then it's only, it's always just rank two answers. Ah, yeah. I have you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please, please. Yeah, I want to see it. This is about the, the problem of spin chain. That is, at each side you have uh, three states of the spin. So it's the spin one. So you can say it's half. Something like this. Mm -hmm. yes. oh. <coughs> Let's make sure that this gets on the recording. Thank you. So. <clears throat> So AKLT, that is Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb, and Tasaki, they wrote down a wave function, I think, which is one of the inspiration for this matrix product states, uh, which, which is the following. I will explain what are the things. That is, since we are talking about spin 1, imagine that the spin, is, spin 1 object is made up of two quarks, like you know, two spin half objects. Then, of course, if you combine two spin half objects, you can sp get spin 1 as well as spin 0. So, that spin 0 should be eliminated. So, what they said was they wrote down a wave function, which is a matrix product wave function, which later became very useful for studying an antiferromagnetic uh, Hamiltonian involving spin 1 on a chain, and which exhibited what is called a Haldane gap phenomenon. But the idea is the following, that is, pictorially, you take this quark and connect it with this form a singlet and so on. So explicitly, the form of the wave function is the following. I will explain all these things. So this vacuum it's just absolute vacuum. Then A's and B's are boson operators. So at every site, I have an A boson and a B boson. Of course, bosons will have infinite number of levels, harmonic oscillator states. But I have only three states. So what I say is that the boson number is restricted to two. Suppose you impose this condition, then you will find if you take these two oscillators per site, you can have an occupancy of 2, 0, or 0, 2, or 1, 1. So these three states will actually correspond to, for example, you know, these up, down, and zero states. So this is the condition. So these are all called Schwinger bosons. Now, it so happens the way, the way the it is written down, if you expand it out, you will find that this will create <coughs> only this kind of states between two neighboring sites. So, automatically, this condition is satisfied by this particular state. So, this is matrix product state in terms of this auxiliary boson variables. It can be also written in the, this basis, but that I don't remember. It's not that neat. So this is how the, so the way that you motivated it, it was very complicated. But here there is a, because you are focusing on one, gro namely ground state, where there is translation invariance and so on, this is very nicely exhibited. So, I mean, you will find references in the internet. Yeah. So, excuse me, one, one means one is spin up, one is spin down, one is spin up. Which one? Yeah, this, uh, this one, that means there are two both oscillators, and each oscillator has is in the first excited state. That's the meaning of one one. I'm asking, what does it mean in terms of that uh, spin up picture? Okay, this is that. that is. So I have you now I start with uh, a site, and uh, have two harmonic oscillators. Now I make a correspondence between three states of these two harmonic oscillator to spin one. So what I do is I take the two harmonic oscillators and have the first oscillator in the second state, there, is, there are two bosons, then 0 or 0, 2 or 1, 1. That is automatically satisfied by this. Now, if you look at this, for example, if you expand it, uh, you will get uh, terms like this. For example, if you choose any 
it will things like suppose you start from the beginning e3 this means uh, in the second site oscillator one is excited and oscillator two is also excited then it will have terms like this that is oscillator 2 or the b oscillator in the second side is excited twice so this will be the structure so by construction it is a matrix product state and it turns out to be an eigen uh, ground uh, state of a very nice hamiltonian also so in every matrix is 2 by 2 exactly in the language, it will be like 2 by 2 or four, yeah something along this line there is a better representation in terms of uh, this basis, but I don't remember, but this is how it goes. Well, thank you for that. So, okay, that's great. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I think we've run a bit over time, so we best stop here. Um, feel free to bug me if you've got any questions otherwise see you next week Thank you.